Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, online session on behalf of Arrhythmia uh, Academy. Uh, I'm Dilad Gupta, consultant electrophysiologist at Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital in the United Kingdom, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this session titled How to Perform Cardioneuroablation. Now, you may be aware that there has been a lot of interest in this area recently, and I'm sure you will benefit from uh, listening to the experts in the field. Uh, speaking of which, I'm delighted to be joined today by um, two of the stalwarts in this field, Associate Professor Dr. Tolga Aksu from Istanbul in Turkey and uh, Professor Joseph Kotsner from uh, Prague in Czech Republic. Uh, welcome, Tolga, and welcome, Dr. Kotsner. So the way we are going to run this session today is uh, Dr. Aksu will take us through a step-by-step -step guide as to how to perform cardio ablation in the capsule laboratory. And that'll take us about 10 minutes or so. After that, uh, the three of us are going to have a discussion about uh, this procedure, where it stands, which other patients to offer it to and who not to offer it to, and what are the controversial aspects of this procedure. So I hope you will enjoy this. Dr. Tolga Aksu, the floor is all yours. Um, first of all, I would like to thank to uh, dear friend uh, Diraj for his kind invitation. Uh, actually, in this uh, brief discussion, I will try to demonstrate some procedural steps of cardinal ablation strategy, and this is my disclosures. Actually, to neuromodulate autonomic nerve system or to ablate parasympathetic system, we should uh, know the cardiac neuroanatomy. And uh, according to the old concept from experimental studies, uh, we believe that the most GPs or ganglion plexus are embedded around three epicardial fat pads. But uh, as an important point, uh, today, we know that this is just an animal experiment, and in human, actually, there are more than uh, five uh, distinct localization for uh, ganglionated plexus sites. And as another important point, again, again, according to animal experiment, we see selective innervation for sinoatrial node and atrioventricular nodal system. For example, in this well-designed study, if you look at right atrial and right ventricular electrogram, uh, during vagal stimulation, we should see negative chronotropic and dromotropic effect. But if you extract this uh, epicardial fat pad area during vagal stimulation, despite existence of sinus bradycardia, you will not see AV block. So this uh, area is important for vagal innervation of AV node. And then if you surgically remove this site, uh, you will not see sinus bradycardia or AV block. So this RA is important for the innervation of sinoatrial node, but in human, actually studies demonstrated that there are at least five major and um, two minor ganglionated plexus around uh, left and right atria. And as an important point, great majority of ganglionated plexus are located between left atrial and right atrial structures in midline area. This is very important during a uh, catheter ablation procedure. And we recently defined a new uh, concept to understand our ablation effect. Actually, ganglionated plexus uh, define grouping epicardial ganglia in some distinct atrial part, but we also see postganglionated neuronal fibers from this epicardial ganglia to sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, or even ventricular area. So during catheter ablation, we can ablate both this epicardial ganglia or postganglionated neuronal fibers. Actually, we should ablate epicardial ganglia because if we can detect the localization of epicardial ganglia, our lesion will be permanent because neuronal bodies cannot be regenerated after any damage. But if you just ablate postganglionated neuronal fibers after the procedure, you can see a similar heart rate increase effect. But during follow up, you can see re-innervation due to axonal regeneration process. This is a very important point. And as another important question, how can we detect localization of GPs during electrophysiological study? Different groups use different techniques, but mostly we use high frequency stimulation or electrogram analysis. Basically, during high frequency stimulation, uh, with, by using different techniques, you should try to find uh, vagar, positive vagar response sites. For example, if you are in a ganglionated plexus site, your HFS application will cause vagal discharge. 
So you will see such a ventricular pulse during atrial fibrillation or during sinus rhythm. But if you don't see any uh, AV block or any sinus bradycardia, you can say that this array is normal atrial myocyte site. But there are a lot of pitfalls of HFS application, time consuming method. Uh, there is still no consensus for prepare protocol and criteria for positive response are not identical between studies. And the most important limitation you will see a lot of induction of atrial fibrillation episodes, and you have to cardiovert this one. But uh, in this well-designed case, we demonst actually we demonstrated that existence of or induction of atrial fibrillation will also demonstrate localization of ganglionated plexus by using HFS application. But we still don't know which technique or which endpoint is clear for GP detection by using HFS application. So we currently try to define a simple uh, technique without using any additional equipment. And this is the birth of our fragmented electrogram uh, guided cardioinnervation strategy. In a well-designed study, Lelucho to studied right at, uh, left atrial electrograms during uh, sinus rhythm and demonstrated three different electrogram characteristics, normal atrial electrogram or uh, fragmented atrial electrograms demonstrating more than three or four deflections. And if you see more deflections on electrograms, you will see more positive vagal response during RF application. In another study, Pachon compared different bandpass filter settings to detect the uh, real fragmentation. And they found that if you use higher high pass filters, for example, two or 300 hertz uh, rather than uh, classical 30 hertz one, you will clearly detect real fragmentation or real number of deflections. So in our current technique, we changed bandpass filter to 200 and 500 hertz, and we are trying to find uh, define fragmented electrograms in a region that is consistent with probable localization of ganglionated plexus. And in a comparison study, we compared a pure electrogram guided cardioinnervation strategy with a combination of spectral analysis plus high frequency stimulation. And we found that actually uh, our current technique related to a shorter procedure and scopy time with a similar effect on heart rate variability and sink of burden. So we completely changed our technique. We just use fragment electrograms. In the first step, we mapped right atrial and left atrial structures. This is very important because, again, great majority of epicardial ganglia located in midline area between right atrial and left atrial structures. So you should demonstrate this close relationship between superior vena cava and right superior pulmonary vena, corner sinus ostium and lower part of left atrium and interatrial septum. You can use any uh, mapping catheter to map right atrial and left atrial structures, but then we changed our mapping catheter with a classical ablation catheter, and then we changed our bandpass filter to 200 and 500 hertz. You can see some other examples. Regardless of low amplitude or high amplitude one, we are trying to find these fragmented electrograms. And in another study, we found that the great majority of these fragmented electrograms are uh, located in this midline area, and this was compatible with anatomical data of armor at all. So by using this fragmented electrogram guided strategy, you can see the possible localization of uh, ganglionated plexocytes. The most, uh, the biggest one is right superior GP located between anterior wall of right superior pulmonary vena and posterior subtal wall of superior vena cava. And this is important for vagal innervation of sinoatrial node. The other one is posterior medial left GP. Uh, you can see the localization around corner sinus ostium, and this is important for vagal innervation of atrioventricular nodal area. And you can see the other uh, distinct GP localization. As an important point, for example, in this uh, figure, uh, in this video, you can see the uh, real-time intracardiac electrograms in below, and you can see the fragmented electrograms. We are starting to perform ablation. Uh, abla during ablation on left-sided GPs, you will usually see such a, a AV block or significant sinus bradycardia episodes due to WAGA response. This is a, uh, this is a typical response for left-sided GPs. Uh, our ablation endpoint should be a complete elimination of 
all fragmented electrograms. And if you see vagar response in any site, you should completely eliminate this uh, positive vagar response uh, after elimination of fragmented electrograms. Again, during ablation on another uh, left-sided GPs, this is a Marshall track GP. In below, you can see the fragmented electrograms. And during RF application, we are seeing significant sinus bradycardia. Yes, here we go. You will see such a prolongation on PP interval during RF application. But during RF application on right superior GP site, we don't see any vagar response in uh, almost 100% of cases. Again, you can see the fragmented electrograms. We started ablation. Let's see the sinus rate. During RF application on right superior GP site, we will see such a steep increase on sinus rate without any vagar response. Another example. Again, please look at the fragmented electrograms. We are starting ablation. You can see the baseline heart rate. After first RF point, you can see such a steep increase on sinus rate in this site. This is the main difference between left-sided and right-sided GPs. But in some cases, despite ablation of all left atrial GPs like left superior martial tract, left inferior or right superior GP, we can't achieve desired heart rate increase. In such a case, we are we usually perform ablation in a little, a little bit higher uh, or superior part, aorta superior vena cava GP side. For example, in this case, we went to the right side, we are on aorta superior vena cava GP side, and after first RF attempt, we increase the heart rate. I would like to demonstrate the difference between empiric anatomical ablation and uh, EGM guided strategy. For example, in this patient, we are checking right atrial and left, left atrial close relationship. For example, according to anatomical empiric anatomical ablation, you can perform ablation in this in who this site. Uh, but for example, I will demonstrate yes please look at the electrograms there is no fragmentation in this site we perform amplic ablation but there is no increase on sinus rate you can see the uh, intracardiac electrograms in below another rf attempt but then we are checking fragmentation let's see let's see there is fragmented electrograms in this site and after the first RF attempt, you can see the steep increase on heart rate levels. So I think that to use fragmented electrograms uh, will limit your, uh, will restrict a very larger ablation attempt by using empiric anatomical ablation. This is a very important point. Just two uh, slides about AV block. If, you, if there is a AV block in your cases, you should target posterior medial left GP site. For example, in this case, there is a persistent AV block. We are performing ablation for posterior medial left GP via left atrium, but it doesn't work. So we are going to the right side. We are in corner sinus ostium, but very close to the left side of lesions. And after the first RF attempt, we achieved one-to-one -one AV conduction. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Tolga. That was uh, very nice and concise. And uh, yet you gave us a lot of detail in terms of your procedural workflow. Uh, what is your endpoint for the procedure? Do you use um, atropine infusion at all? Actually, um, we still use um, complete elimination of electrograms complete elimination of positive vagar response in all left-sided GPs. And we are trying to achieve uh, 100 um, BPM heart rate level. We are trying to increase heart rate level, sinus rate. And okay. if in any AV block cases, 
Before the procedure, we check atrophin response and we check the PR interval levels and we are trying to achieve these PR interval levels or rank of points. Okay, so you've got this arbitrary cutoff or arbitrary target of 100 beats per minute. And how often in your experience do you not manage to achieve that? Sorry. How often do you not achieve the target of 100 beats per minute? Actually, actually in, in almost all cases, we can achieve this heart rate increase, but it depends on which anesthesia do you use during the procedure. For example, if you use general anesthesia, you can't achieve this uh, heart rate levels, but even if you use uh, two or three, three milligram atropine, because it will decrease both parasympathetic and sympathetic tones. So uh, we usually use uh, mild sedation during cardio neurovision. This is very important to see both positive vagal response or to see a uh, heart rate increase. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Well, I'm sure we'll come back with uh, a bit more discussion and questions. But before uh, we do that, I just wanted to ask uh, Professor Kostner about his own experience with cardioneuroablation in Prague. And what does he feel uh, about the procedure? Where does it stand now? Which are the patients we should be offering it to? Uh, Professor Kotzner. Well, thank you for the uh, word. I, I, I have to say that we started in 2014. And since then, we gradually increase the uh, numbers of patients. Now we have about 130 uh, cases and we try to do two cases per week. We use a bit different strategy because we, we have, at the beginning, we try to use this uh, high frequency stimulation at the site of ganglion plexi. We used also MIBG imaging with uh, this uh, special camera, but uh, we learned from this experience that uh, probably the best uh, strategy is uh, just empirical, anatomical, but guided by a global vagal response assessment and this was described by uh, Jose Pachon and we have his uh, stimulator. We always uh, do now the procedure in uh, general anesthesia. We put uh, a pacing lead very high under the skill, uh, sc uh, sorry, under the skull uh, in the area where, where the vagal nerve comes from the, the skull, uh, sometimes even on both sides. And then you, you stimulate in high frequency with high power, and you have global vagal reflex, like uh, asystole for 10, 15 seconds. Uh, and if you pace, you have also AV block. And then after this anatomically guided application of radio frequency energy, you can retest. And when you abolish uh, this uh, uh, reflex, you know that you've done something. And uh, we, we don't care that much about the uh, uh, rise of uh, uh, frequency because uh, this might be transient phenomenon, or it might be even detrimental if, if you reach a really high uh, sinus uh, rate. So, and depending uh, if, if there is uh, just a sinus bradycardia, or if there is also AB block, we can, we can add to, uh, to uh, ablation also this posteromedial ganglionic plexus to, to correct uh, AV block. And um, it seems to work really nicely. I mean, we have, uh, when we analyzed about half of this population, we had uh, about a 90% success rate in the prevention of syncope or correction of uh, bradycardia. And uh, where it doesn't work, it's usually uh, um, uh, vasodepressory syncope. Uh, sometimes it's not obvious uh, that there is a partly um, uh, cardio inhibitory and partly uh, vasodepressory. So it turns that uh, these cases unsuccessful are more uh, vasodepressory. It doesn't work also in a sick sinus syndrome, obviously patients are mm. usually older patients. They should be implanted with pacemaker, uh, but it works in younger patients. And sometimes the age like 50, 55, up to 60, uh, you, you have to do uh, always atropine test. Uh, that's what we do before we indicate the patient for, for this uh, procedure. And uh, no, I, I think this is one of the uh, greatest advances in catheter ablation, not arrhythmia in this case, but in general. And I, I really would like to um, make all efforts or put all efforts into, uh, let's say spread of this uh, strategy and, and uh, let more people to do it because this is uh, simpler than AFib ablation or VT ablation. 
And uh, the patients are really so happy. And we have uh, also a few patients where we had to explant the pacemaker, which was uh, implanted previously in other places. And the, the patient had uh, still bradic- uh, syncope, for instance, and we had to explant pacemaker because the patient is uh, okay and does not need any pacemaker. So I, I think this is the best argument that this is not a placebo effect. And yeah. when you measure this global vagal response, and then you abolish completely this uh, response. So you know that this is not uh, just a placebo. I, I really believe that this is very important. And I hope that next version of guidelines will, will contain already uh, some, um, uh, some section about methodology, about the results of, uh, of this kind of procedure. And I, I know that in uh, Warsaw, in Poland, uh, my friends, they do a randomized study and these uh, studies and observational studies are very important to spread this idea and uh, really make it procedure, which is a st- sort of state of the art procedure for this kind of uh, uh, disorder. Mm-hmm. Now, indeed. Um, so this is a very difficult group of patients to treat. Historically, vasovagal syncope was one group of patients which electrophysiologists used to run away from because we could not really offer anything to these patients. Drug therapy had limited efficacy. But uh, it's interesting that over the past few years, uh, thanks to efforts from people like Tolga and yourself, that there has been a renewed interest in this. Now, interestingly, um, there's been some criticism of this procedure, say that this may be all placebo effect. But as you say, that you've got objective evidence now to show that these patients actually do benefit from this uh, in terms of the heart rate variability, in terms of syncope frequency being decreased. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there is definitely something yeah. to it. You, you see these patients, you know, we had, for instance, patient who had uh, deglutition syncope and he, he, he was really desperate because he had so many syncopes and he was evaluated everywhere, you know, in different uh, teaching hospitals in Czech Republic. And they told him, oh, we probably, you would need a new vertebral column and everything changed. You know, this is impossible. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, then he had this neuroablation. And since then, he's without any complaints. We published this case report. And he, when you see cases like this, I mean, you, you believe even without randomized trials that this is really something that works. Sure. Tolga, in your opinion, which is the ideal patient to benefit from cardioneuroablation? Actually, I... I, I... I totally agree with your full comments of uh, Professor Kautzner. The main target, of course, should be the cardioimperative reflex of cases. But according to our experience, you can, if you can demonstrate dominant cardioimperative response, you can also use this technique in mixed tip cases. But I totally agree it's, that doesn't work in pure vasodepressive cases because we check tilt testing in some cases after the procedure, uh, and you still see was a depressive response, but there is no syncope. This is the most important point. And actually there is no uh, theoretical explanation to uh, work in this population. So I don't suggest to use this technique in pure was a depressive cases. This is a very important point. And as another important point, totally agree, yes, it should be attempted in younger population. If you, because it's not easy to discriminate functional AV block or functional sinus node dysfunction in older patients. So if there is another indication like PVI, for example, if there is the existence of atrial fibrillation plus sinus bradycardia, you may try GP ablation in addition to, in addition to PVI. You can add GP ablation, but in other ways, you don't uh, perform cardinal ablation in any older patients. Okay, so uh, as a general rule, younger patients, say less than 50 years of age, uh, or certainly less than 40 years of age, who have predominantly cardio-inhibitory syncope rather than vasodepressor syncope. Um, so that's a useful point for our readers. Um, the other question I wanted to ask was uh, about the rec- replicability of the results, because um, unlike only in isolation, where you have a very good objective endpoint, with cardioneuroablation, there isn't that good an endpoint. So a lot of electrophysiologists have historically shrugged their shoulders and said, oh, this is all voodoo. We don't understand this. Is this is there a good endpoint or not? There are different ways of doing it. For example, Professor Kostner said that they use cardioneuroablation of the um, carotid ganglia. Obviously, in your case, you go with a pure electrogram-based approach. So there are so many differences. So how can we improve the replicability of this 
procedure amongst different operators. Professor Kasper, first please. Well, uh, I think uh, at least at this stage when we are still learning, uh, this uh, high frequency stimulation of vagal nerve uh, is, uh, we believe, very important because it really gives you clear endpoint. It's a global vagal re reaction or reflex where you, you can abolish. So it, this is for us, uh, really, you, you could test it even after each application of uh, energy. Sometimes you can abolish uh, really after two, three applications. Sometimes it needs really much more. So to avoid uh, over ablation, mm -hmm. uh, we, we uh, use this, uh, which is a bit... Uh, uh, difficult because you have to have uh, general anesthesia because it's quite painful and patient would have uh, spasm of uh, all of muscles. So maybe when we have more experience, uh, we could maybe rely on some surrogate uh, markers like uh, heart rate or some other maybe markers. I, I don't know at the moment, but that's why we believe that it's very important before the technique becomes uh, really more widespread um, and we, we get uh, more experience, we, we try to get uh, this response. But if I can get back to indication, uh, the other indication is also functional bradycardia. Some patients, again, younger patients, they may have a bradycardia. And if they are symptomatic, they are tired all the time. They, you, you do exercise and they, they don't uh, get a higher uh, rate during exercise and uh, they react to atropine. This is another beautiful indication for, for neuroablation. And uh, uh, Dan Wichterle, who did uh, most of cases in our center, he, he even believes that this is even more rewarding uh, for the patients because uh, those patients with uh, really severe uh, syncopes, uh, vasovagal syncopes, they are not so frequent, but more frequently, uh, they, they have combination of this bradycardia, which uh, can be treated very nicely. And we had even some cases of functional AV block, which was symptomatic, and it was also uh, successfully treated by neuroablation. So we are still learning, but uh, you have to consider now every younger patient with uh, any of these bradycardias or syncopes to, uh, to be uh, really evaluated for uh, neuroablation. And a very exciting time for the um, for the technology and for the technique, the procedure, uh, which brings me to the question that up until now, it's only a few enthusiasts in the world who are doing this. Has the time now come for cardioneuroablation to be part of a formal EP training program? <laughs> Actually, formal EP program is not ready, I think, because... Uh, the population should be selected very well because uh, in other ways, a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, attempt we can see. And not a lot of unnecessary uh, ablation. For example, I, I think that if you perform a radiofrequency based PVI and if you experience operator about uh, RF guided PVI, you can use this technique. I think this is the most important point because I agree with Professor Joseph uh, about it is easier than PVI. This is my uh, comment. But uh, it's not, if you don't perform routinely RF guided PVI, you shouldn't attempt cardinal vision. What well, do you I think of the that this is, uh, this is basically the truth. And if somebody can do a, a PVI with a radio frequency current point by point, he can do this ablation as well. But uh, the more important is to really be more experienced in a selection of patients, to do atropine test, uh, really to follow these patients. And th this is now more important than uh, technique itself because technique itself is easy to adopt uh, if you have experience with uh, uh, electroanatomical mapping and ablation in left atrium and right atrium. Mm -hmm. I agree. So uh, I think the time is probably right for us to do a randomized uh, study with cardioneuroablation compared to pacemaker, compared to drug therapy. Are you, uh, are either of you aware of such a study going on? I'm only aware of a study which my colleagues in Poland do. They, they will publish uh, results uh, probably soon. And uh, yeah, that, that's a way of how to go. But uh, if you have uh, several years of experience, in uh, like in our center, you become reluctant now to, yeah. uh, to randomize patients because you know that it works. 
Uh, but I, I think uh, for for those who are not yet uh, uh, sort of persuaded that it works, I think that's the the only way uh, that they can do a randomized study, and they they will see. I think yeah, that the uh, authors of Syncop guideline will ask this question to us. They always said that uh, there is a placebo effect in Vazovaga Syncop case. Yes, I know there there might be a placebo effect, but by using implantable group recorder or by using heart rate variable parameter, we can clearly demonstrate our uh, endpoints in almost all cases and in during long-term follow-up. So uh, like in atrial fibrillation ablation, for example, you implant implantable group recorder and then check the AFib burden before and after the procedure. Uh, you, and in this technique, you can check bradycardia burden before and after the procedure. This is a very clear endpoint, I think. If there is no bradycardia during, for example, three years follow-up period, you can say that, yes, this technique is works. There is no placebo effect, I think. I think what Perfect. we need is actually a combination of observational studies, prospective studies uh, with a follow-up, like you mentioned. We need uh, maybe randomized studies of uh, those who really want to uh, to do a serious randomized study. Uh, we need uh, more data, but uh, the data is already here and uh, we need to really uh, discuss and, uh, and you know, uh, try to propagate this idea that uh, people can, uh, can uh, think about uh, this uh, strategy and maybe they can visit uh, some of the existing centers to see a uh, procedure because this, this is also very important that you see and if you see, you start to believe, and then you, you are more enthusiastic. So, of course, uh, we are all willing to, to help uh, some others if they have uh, ideas or if they have courage to start. Uh, we all will help. Well, on, that, on that note, I think um, we should probably be thinking about drawing this to a close because uh, you know, the time is kind of ticking. Um, I'm sure our readers would have really enjoyed um, this session. They would have learned a lot about cardiomyopathy ablation, and I'm sure a lot of them would have been would be enthusiastic. And thanks very much for your kind offer of proctoring uh, on site. And I know Tolga has been proctoring online as well, so that obviously will uh, spread the evidence base uh, to EPs all over the world. Um, so a special thanks to the co-panelists for today, uh, Associate Professor Tolga Axu from Istanbul in Turkey. Professor Joseph Kotzner uh, from Prague in Czech Republic. And I would like to thank uh, Arrhythmia Academy for hosting us today. So thank you and keep up. Bye-bye.